This is a lesson about money, part two. You can find uh, part one on uh, YouTube and Sermon Network. We talked about money last week and tithes, offerings, and alms. We looked at the Old Testament. We looked at the law. We even looked at the church age and what the Christian is supposed to give. I must state as a fact is this study is to be written and to be used in the King James Version of the Bible. If you don't have a King James Version, if you're not using the King James Version, your answers are going to be incorrect. And they'll be incorrect at the judgment seat of Christ. And they'll be incorrect at the judgment seat, I mean, at the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. Plain and simple. There's only one word, there's only one God, there's only one Jesus, one Savior. So there's got to be one word, the King James 1611 Bible. Now, as we break into part two, uh, last week we got all the Christians upset because we talked about tithing, we talked about offering, talked about a willing heart, we talked about a loving heart that if you don't want to give willingly, you don't want to, you give grudgingly, don't give at all because God is not going to count it to your record. God wants you to give it in love. He wants you to give it because you want to give it, not because you have to and don't have all these thermometers and all that other junk. Now, if you got by that without having a heart attack and eating EMS and 911 and everything like that, well, this one may get you upset. We're going to need to talk about taxes. Yeah, we all love the taxes. We all enjoy the IRS. We all enjoy the, the tax collector. Yeah, but do we remember one fact is that Matthew was called to be a tax collector tax collector. Do you remember that Jesus Christ even sat and ate and talked with the publicans and the tax collectors? Matthew made a meeting. He made a dinner. Invited all his tax collector friends. And Jesus sat down with them. And I think you do know about the fish story of Peter and Jesus. Maybe we'll get into that. If not, maybe that gives you a little extra study to look into your Bible about a fish, taxes, Peter, and Jesus. If we don't talk about that. Letter A. As we get going. As we're going to make you nice and happy. To do what the Bible says. That's what we want to do. Right? Amen. Glory to God. You want to do what the Bible says? Be know that once we do these studies. And if you don't do what the Bible says. You'll be guilty. To him that knows to do right and doeth it not. To him it is sin. Does the government have a right. To charge taxes to its people. Now, I know what answer you want as you turn to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. I know what the answer you want to hear. You want to hear no. You want to hear that the government does not have a right to tax you. That is illegal. And we can go join some organization, go throw some tea into the ocean, and just fight and fight and rebel and rebel. And we're going to see about rebellion. I know we are. Okay? You want to join this party and fight against taxes and all that. And let's see what the Bible is. And let's see what you, how much you are a rebellion. Matthew 22, verse 17 to 21. I'll quote this part of the verse. Tell us, therefore, talking to Jesus. They're tempting Jesus. Hey, they want, what they want to do is they really want to get Jesus to say, No. Say no to taxes, and yay, we can get Jesus over the Roman government, no crucify him early, and we got rid of this hypocrite, this guy, we can do anything we want to do, praise God, glory to me. So they say, tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give the tribute unto Caesar or not? Now, tribute is taxes. In verse 18, but Jesus perceived their wickedness. Did you get that? They were really out to trick Jesus. They were really looking out for something else. They didn't really want to know the answer. They just wanted to get Jesus at his words. They wanted to, to, to find something for the Roman government to arrest Jesus. That's why they asked the question. And said, why can't ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And he brought unto him a penny. And said unto him, Whose is the image and superscription? And they said unto him, Abraham Lincoln's. 
Then said he unto them, Render therefore to the United States government, President Obama, the things that are President Obama, the United States government, and unto God, the things that are God. He said, Don't say that. They gave him a penny. What's on your penny? What does it say on the penny? It says, Abraham Lincoln, United States government. Who is the leader of our nation today? President Obama. Oh, you didn't want me to change the Bible for you? That's not correct? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you wanted the Bible that's up to date get on the whole thing. That's a new and improved. What is this image in superscription? They said unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God. You know that money you have in your pocket is not yours? I wish I had a, something right now. I don't. I didn't think about it. What does that money say that's in your wallet, in your pocket? It says United States of America. It does not have your name on it. I don't care if your name is Abraham Lincoln or George Washington or Franklin Delano Roosevelt and whoever else is Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. I don't care if your name. That's not you on that money. That money belongs to the government. What makes you think it's yours? Boy, work for it. You know how many countries they work and they don't get nothing? Just because you're American, you think you deserve everything. Only in America where you get Labor Day and you don't even work and get paid for it. Jesus made it very clear. The government does have the right to collect taxes from the people. The word tribute means, and it says, is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar? Money paid from one ruler or nation to another for protection from invasion, a tax levied for this, a tax paid by a vassal to an overlord, any forced payment. And that's out of Webster's Dictionary. You know what you do when you pay taxes? You pay for our armed service men and women that are in the service. In the Jews' case, it was a forced payment to the Roman government. So they were forced just as much as you're forced to pay. Listen, there's two things that are, are very much certain in this world. Taxes and death. And Jesus may come and take you away from death if the rapture happens. Then the only sure thing is would be if Jesus is coming in our time, it would be taxes. We won't see death when Jesus comes. The Roman government, which was ruling over him at the time, they wanted to get Jesus to criticize the Roman government so they could excuse him before them. They wanted to catch Jesus so they can have the government arrest him as a tax evasion. I mean, don't you hear the stories when somebody avoids tax and, and you, you get these stars today, they didn't pay their taxes and they go to jail and all that and they, and they get a deplorable name? That's what they wanted Jesus to be. They wanted to go up to the Roman emperor and say, hey, this man Jesus says, I don't need to pay you. And the Roman government says, oh, yeah, I'll show you what you need not to do. And Jesus said, listen, it's Caesar's. Give it to him. And if it's God, give it to him. In the 1980s and 1990s were a period of patriot and militia movements in the United States. Involved in some of those groups were tax evaders. As people didn't want to pay the taxes. They believed that the government did not have the right to charge taxes of its people. And many of them even used the Bible oh, to try and prove their case. But, Jesus clearly says, pay the government the tax that are due. Plain and simple. The question will be, but what if the government is a corrupt government? Does that mean that which we still have to pay to such a system? Let me ask you a question before we break down the letter B. You are a 
employer, you own a company, you got employees, they work 40 hours or 5 hours or 40 hours every week. Come payday, when they come for their check, you say, well, you're a corrupt employee, you know, you do all this, I don't need to pay you. What about if you're corrupt? What if, you're, what if you want your boss to get your paycheck this way, and he looks at you and says, well, you're corrupt, I don't need to pay you. What would you think? Why would you get mad? Well, part B. Does a Christian have to pay taxes? Oh, to a wicked government. I'm sorry, I lost track there. Does a Christian have to pay taxes to a wicked government? The real question is, does a Christian have to pay taxes? The wicked government is an excuse. Come on. You want to hold all the money you want to hold without paying anybody. You do it to God and you want to do it to the government. It's not like the money you said you would give to God. You just go buy more electronic junks and sink more worms underwater and all other kind of junk and spend gasoline to go somewhere where you're not supposed to be going and doing stuff you're not supposed to be doing. No. To the above verses, some people say the Christians in Jesus' day had to pay taxes, but our government today is wicked. If you pay taxes to our government, then you are supporting abortion. Because part of your tax dollars pay for abortions. Really? You are disobeying God and going against His word if you support such wickedness. You know they always name one sin? Your boss gives you a paycheck, right? And you're completely sinless. You're up there with Jesus Christ, right? The money that he gives you, I mean, do, do, do you buy Marlboro? Do you buy Budweiser? Do you waste gas? Do you, what, 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 you're, you're perfect, right? Yes, our government supports abortion. Yes, our government is wicked. Yes, our government is vile. What's the excuse? Have you read about the Roman government? Wasn't that the government that put Jesus on the cross? Didn't Jesus know that he was going to be put on the cross, crucified by who? The Romans. And knowing that he was going to be crucified by the Romans in, in uh, Jerusalem under the Roman government, yeah, and he turns around and says what? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and render to the things that are God that are God's, knowing that the Roman government was going to crucify him. Knowing that Herod was going to three, four, maybe five times say, I find no fault in him. He's innocent, but still sends him to Calvary. And he still says, knowing that's going to happen, says, you pay money to the Roman government. Can we just say, please, I want to keep all my money and not pay out? You gripe and complain when the electric bill comes and the water bill. We, including myself, we want to keep our money. We don't want to spend it. We complain about the gas. Did I step on your toe? Are you crying foul? Have you turned me off? Because I speak the truth? How do you answer such an accusation? The answer is not that difficult. Again, yeah, simply consider the government of, of Rome in Jesus' day when they were given the when the commandment was given. The Roman government was over Israel at that time. They allowed Jews to govern themselves in little everyday matters, but not in large decisions like capital punishment. You know what the capital punishment was supposed to be for Jesus? You, can you guess? If Jews were in charge and not the Roman government. Jesus would have been stoned. Remember John chapter 5 or 6? They picked up stones. They wanted to stone Jesus. That You ever wonder why they did that? 
Do you ever wonder why Jesus, when that woman was taking adultery, and him that has the first, him that's without sin, pick up the first stone? The stoning was the Jewish form of capital punishment, but Rome would not let them. Now, John eighteen twenty eight to thirty one. John eighteen twenty eight to thirty one. The Jews bring Jesus before Pilate, a Roman government official. Pilate was not Jewish. To request that the sentence of death to Jesus. In verse 29 of John 18, Pilate says, What accusation bring ye against this man? What are the charges? The Jews did not like the Roman officials ruling over them, as is seen by their response in verse 30 of chapter 18 of John. If he were not a malefactor, we would have not delivered him unto thee. That's not what Pilate said. Pilate said, what are the charges? And they're kicking the dirt. Well, if you're not a malefactor, what are the charges? This was a very rude and vague reply to one who was just asking a question and trying to do his job to see that justice was done in the situation. Pilate wanted to know, what are the charges? If he's a criminal, don't we have today, is it in one of the rights of, of someone being arrested, you have the right to something about the charges? Pilate did not, uh, a malefactor is one who commits an offense against the law. Again, Webster's Dictionary. What was the, what was the offense? Pilate did not want to play their foolish game. So he told them in verse 31 of John chapter 8, theme, Take ye him and judge him according to your laws. This shows that the Roman government let them take care of the lesser matter. There was no serious charge brought against Jesus. He said, all right, go, go do the Jewish laws. He's got to pay four lands for, I mean, ten lands for, for four, then you have him pay his ten lands, whatever it is. But the Jews knew their limits under the Romans. So they were quick to point out to Pilate, in the last half of that verse, verse 31 of John 18, it is not lawful for us to put any man to death. They wanted the death penalty for Jesus. But they knew that the Romans would not allow them to administer it. And it was from those scriptures that not a bone of him was broken. That he had to die the way of the cross. The bottom line is this. Pilate was the official judge over Jesus' trial. It was a serious matter. It involved a death penalty. What was his verdict? John 18.38 I find in him no fault at all. So what did Pilate do? Did he release Jesus? Look at John 19.1. Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. You know what scourging is? It's whipping a person. Jesus was totally 100% sinless, innocent, no crime, but Pilate had him whipped. Why? To try and please the Jewish leaders, but when Pilate hadn't seen, uh, but when Pilate had second thoughts, thought about Jesus' innocence, was Pilate beginning to think that maybe Jesus was really guilty? No. And John nineteen four, as we continue on, Pilate therefore went forth and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him number two number one was 1838 
Nineteen four was again charge number two. He's innocent. No four. Well, why did he whip him in verse one? When he brings him out to the Jews again, they'll see this bloody mass of a man and say, Oh, you should, prisoner, you should let him go and be free. It was a product of, of the environment that they had in all my goodness. You American sissies. When they commit a crime, they're obligated to the crime that they committed. But what crime did Jesus commit? Absolutely nothing. This is the second time that he is pronounced innocent. Hallelujah. Our Savior. And you expect the Christian life to be easy and wonderful and hunky-dory? Read the read the story of Jesus and the apostles. Read the stories of Christianity through the history. We'll keep on going. I'm sorry. Again, in John 19:6, Pilate says, "I find no fault in him." Three times, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You know what the law said: out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, the word shall be established. Three times he's, he's said, no fault means he is innocent. I find no crime in him. The pressure gets more fierce. The Jews are actually trying to pressure Pilate that he's not being loyal to his own government. In John 19, 12, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh him a king speaketh against Caesar. You let him go in your Caesar's enemy. And we're going to go tell Caesar on you. <clears throat> Putting the pressure on him. You're saying, Brother Stiley, why are you... What, this is about taxes. We're getting there. We're getting back to that wicked government. Woo! And let me ask you, when we stop here... Tell I sound like a TV evangelist. How many times, Christians, have you been before President Obama and he whipped you for being a Christian? How many times? How many times the United States government whipped you, scourged you because you were innocent, because you were a child of God? Not too often in America. But you don't want to pay taxes to the government because it's a wicked government because it, it, it does abortions. Here's a government that took our Savior, took God's Son, and scourged Him, and three times has declared our Savior, our, our God's Son, our, our righteousness, our author, our finisher, declared Jesus Christ as innocent, and they're still going about to put Him on the cross. But we have a wicked government that we don't want to give money to. Because they do abortion. <laughs> Change your spiritual diaper. This is a wicked government. Took an innocent man and crucified him. We'll keep on going. In, ver uh, in verse 16 in John 19. After more pressure, John 19, 16, Pilate gives in. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. Read with me, John 18, 38. I find no fault in him. Read with me, John 19, 4. I find no fault in him. Let's try it again. 19.6. Did we get it? I find no fault in him. Let's read John 19.16. Then delivered he him, therefore unto them to be crucified. Whoa. 
Now let me ask you a question. What kind of government would you say that this is where, where they take a completely innocent man and they're going to crucify him? Well, we know people in the American government, there are people in jail who have been, you know, been put in an electric chair and they've been put to sleep firmly, and they really didn't do the crime. Yeah, but they're sinners. Jesus Christ was not a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, except for, uh, except for Jesus Christ. There is none righteous, no, not one, except for Jesus Christ. We all should be in prison. We are all under the death penalty for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're all worthy of death through through sin. What was Jesus? It was the Roman soldiers that crucified Jesus in John nineteen twenty three. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to a so to every soldier a part. You know what they did? I don't care what the pictures say. I don't care. Jesus Christ hung on that cross as naked as the day he was born. Everything to be seen. Imagine God out there naked. From his head to his toes and everything else in between being clean. He was made a curse for us. He was made a sin for us who knew, who knew no sin. Cursing him that hangs on a tree. The point is this. How much more wicked could a government possibly be than to put to death the totally innocent and pure Son of God? How wicked is that? That is exactly what the Roman government did. This is the government to which Jesus said to the people, Pay your taxes. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar. Pilate was under Caesar. Jesus even met with, with uh, um, Herod. And Pilate and Herod were made friends that day. For they had infirmity between them. And Herod de declared Jesus as innocent. The religious tax evaders say, if you pay taxes to a government that allows little babies to be put to death in the world, abortion, then you are a murderer. Okay? Let me ask you a question. This is not, this is, this is private. This is not a lesson. Did Peter, uh, did Jesus tell Peter, go fish for a fish? All right. And he said, the first fish you pick up, you're going to find a coin. Right? Okay. What did Jesus tell Peter to do with that money? You mean that Jesus Christ was guilty of paying for his own murder? And Peter too? You see how stupid that sounds? Jesus told Peter, take that coin out of the fish's mouth and go pay taxes. And yet, but they'll say, well, if you do that, you become a murderer too. Well, Jesus Christ paid for his own murder then. Must have been some expensive coin. There is a terrible wickedness to put precious little babies to death by abortion. That, that's, I'm not going against abortion. Abortion is murder. Pure outright. That sin pollutes the land and will evidently require bloodshed because of it. Listen, when, when Cain killed Abel, God told Cain, said, Listen, I hear your brother's blood crying out. I hear Abel's blood speaking. Numbers 35. There is a vast warning of God for those who will kill, kill others. And God told Noah, even, he says, listen, a man that sheds man's blood shall be put to death. His blood shall be shamed. He even said an animal that sheds man's blood 
shall be accounted to him. And Numbers 35, verse 33. So you shall not pollute the land. Now, you know what you say today, pollute the land. You know, you throw styrofoam and plastic on the ground. You don't put them in the trash container. Let's see what God says about polluting the land. Numbers 35, 33. So ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye are. For blood it defileth the land, and the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. But there is one thing even worse than shedding the blood of innocent babies. That is the shedding the blood of the perfect, precious Son of God. But it was to this very government, the wicked government of the Romans, that put Jesus to death. And Jesus made his statement that we are to pay to the government. He told those Jews, you are to pay to the Roman government, even though that Roman government put Jesus to death. So that violates your decision about the government that commits abortion because Jesus Christ is higher and better than any baby. Jesus knew what was going to happen. And knowing that, he still told them, you pay taxes to Caesar. And he said, Caesar. Let's move on. Argument. Well, the scripture prophesied that Jesus had to die, so that does not count. And that is not a legitimate argument. Because what about the other innocent people that the Roman government put to death? Do you know what, um, oh, I can't think of his name now. The governor of Rome. When Peter and Paul were, I can't think. Well, Acts 12, 1 and 2, about the time Herod the king, Acts 12, 1 and 2, about the time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Herod was the Roman king of the area, and he killed one of the apostles. But that was not all that he planned to do. Acts 12, 3. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, the same ones that wanted Jesus killed, he proceeded further to take Peter also. It was the Roman governor... That put Peter in jail, and in verse chapter 4, he's going to crucify, or, uh, yeah, he's going, his plans are to crucify Peter. He's going to kill Peter after the Roman holiday called Easter. 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 Called Easter. It was the same Roman government. Nero, that's what I wanted to say. Nero. This is Nero. You know what Nero used to do? He would put Christians on poles and put tar in them and light them on fire when he had his garden parties and say, Look, this is my party and we've got the light of Jesus to give us light so we can feast. This is Nero. It was the same Roman government that instructions went forth to the churches in Rome in Romans chapter 13 and verse 1 Romans 13 1 let every soul be subject unto a higher powers for there is no power but of God the powers that be are ordained of God that was just as much as the king of uh, the Herod the king of, of Rome as Nero as President Obama in America today, that God put him in charge, and God says, you are to be subject to that man, no matter what he was doing to the Christians, no matter that he tried to kill Peter, no matter that he did kill James, 
you are still to be under his subject. No, it does not mean God approves of the government decisions. He does not. But God put them to be. God ordained them to where they to be. And you are obligated by the word of God, by Paul, by Peter, you are to obey the powers that be. You are not to make fun of your president. You are not to bash your president. And when you do, Christian, you are violating. You need to claim 1 John 1, 9 and put it under the blood. Because if you don't, you'll stand at the judgment seat of Christ as disobeying your president. Oh, he don't know what he's doing. Well, maybe God will give you a job where you don't know what you're doing, and may everybody rank on you. Okay? Be not deceived. God's not marked. Whatsoever man soweth that he shall also reap. May you get put in the same thing that you, that President Obama's in, and people pick on you. Hey, I'm preaching the Bible. I see President Obama as a lost soul. I don't care about his presidency. I pray to God in heaven. I look to New Jerusalem. I tell people about Jesus. I try to raise people up in Jesus. That's my job. When the government's gone and America's gone, the only thing I have to rely is on Jesus Christ and his word no matter what. And we'll keep on going. I anger some of you and I don't care. Conversation took place between Pilate and Jesus in John 19, 10 and 11. In John 19, 10 and 11, Then said Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee? And have power to release thee? Really? How come he didn't release them? Isn't that funny? I have this power and he didn't use it. Moron. And Jesus answered, Son of God, God himself, I don't care if you're a Jehovah Witness, Jesus is God, this is God speaking <clears throat> on you. Thou could have no power at all against me, except it were given, except it be, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivereth me unto thee has the greater sin. God gave Pilate the power. God gave President Reagan the power. God gave President Bush the power. God gave President Clinton the power. God gave President Obama the power. If the Lord is a terror, the next president, he's going to get to the power. God will allow the Antichrist to run and rule the world. You're walking on very hard ground here. You are to obey the law. You are to obey the government. The government. You are to obey the powers. You are to be an example. How is President Obama going to get saved by the Lord God of the Bible, by Jesus Christ, who is God, when the Bible and He knows you shall love your enemies? And every Christian speaks ill of him and as an enemy. Do you ever think about that? Number one, government leaders only get into power because God allows them. Psalm 75, 6 and 7. Memorize this verse. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He put it down one and sells up another. I don't know why that guy got promoted. He's my boss now. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God. God gave that guy a promotion. 
but I don't like him. Talk to God. God promoted him. Why did they get the promotion? Because God didn't give it to you. Psalm 75, 6 and 7. All promotions come from God. Did you get that? That's a hard one to swallow, isn't it? Now, I've had bosses and people promoted, and I didn't like them. But God put them there. Number two. Government leaders will only... Uh, government leaders will one day answer to God for how they have ruled. Remember that Jesus did not say to Pilate that it's okay, you are innocent. Jesus simply said unto him, He that delivered me unto thee has the greater sin. John 19, 11. Pilate will one day stand before Jesus Christ and give an account. King Herod or Nero will stand before Jesus one day and give an account. President George Washington will give an account before Jesus Christ. President Truman will give an account. The Queen of Elizabeth will give an account. Mikhail Gilbertshoff will give an account. Um, I can't think of anybody else. Rulers, governors, mayors, kings, the the honcho of the country of all honchos. All these these people that rise up down in uh, South America and, and take over the country by military and all that will give an account to God. Adolf Hitler will stand before Jesus the Jew. Isn't that a joke? And give an account for all the brethren that he killed of Jesus. President Obama will give an account one day of what he did and what he didn't do. Listen, you will give an account of what you did and what you didn't do. They all sinned in letting an innocent person die going back to Pilate in the Roman government. And James, you know every single apostle but John suffered a violent death? And John was even put into boiling oil or water, I forget which it was, and set in the, on the island of Platmus. They will give an account, and I got a need to hurry. But the greater sin was on the part of the Jewish leaders who had the word of God and should have received Jesus as their Messiah. Number three, a believer may have to sometimes disobey a law of the government. If he calls him to directly or personally disobey the law of God. I've got to say this very quick and very clear. In Exodus 1, 15 and 16. The king of Egypt told the midwives. When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women. And see them upon the stools. If it be a son. Then ye shall kill him. Talk about abortion. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. When you see that baby come right out of the womb, if it's a male child, you are to abort that baby. What do you call half abortion? This is abortion, very great. Kill the baby. Newborn. The midwives chose to obey God because God says, Thou shalt not kill. Which meant disobeying the king of Egypt. And in verse 17 of the same chapter, Exodus 1, but the midwives feared God and did not, as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men, children, alive. There are certain things that the government is going to tell you to do or might tell you to do that's going to violate Scripture. And that's where you're going to have to say, no, I'm going to, I'm going to listen to God, and you might have to take a licking. And might even cost your life. Some of the tax evaders claim that if we pay taxes, then we are no better than the doctors or nurses who performed abortions, or the German soldiers who obeyed Hitler and slaughtered Jews. But from the above example, we see that this is a false accusation number two. If the government commands you to kill innocent people, then you have the, you have the right to disobey the government 
and take whatever punishment comes to you. But paying taxes to the government does not make you a murderer because what they do or do not do with the money that they collect from you. Once you pay, they will win by ones who answer to God if they misuse their power as government leaders. I want to say something, but let me finish. It was to the wicked gov Roman government that the Christians in the churches were commanded, render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And who said that? Paul said that in Romans 13.7. So the answer is yes, God does expect a Christian to pay taxes even to a wicked government. In a free country where we are all mere responsible to get out and vote and elect righteous people into office. But even if we do not succeed, we still have the duty as citizens to pay our taxes. There has never been more wicked government than Rome. Some think that President Obama is the most wicked government. President Obama has not killed Christians. He has not persecuted Christians. Maybe not as yet. Fox's Book of Martyrs talks about all of Rome. The one that crucified the innocent Son of God. But Christians were told to even pay taxes due to Rome, the wicked government. So that violates, oh, you know, it's a wicked government. I don't have to pay. Listen, Rome was killing Christians. And Paul in Romans 13, 7, after James has died, been slaughtered with the sword, Paul says, you pay that same Roman government their taxes. How's that? How's that, monkey? We are thus commanded to pray earnestly for our government officials. In 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications and prayers and intercessions and the giving of thanks. Have you thanked God for President Obama? Have you prayed for him? Be made for all men, presidents, senators, House of Representatives, Supreme Courts, mayors, judges, policemen, firemen, governors, bosses, for kings, for all that are in authority. That's a bad word in America today, authority. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. America's in an uproar right now because you don't pray for your president. You don't intercede for him. You don't thank God for him. And we got all kinds of uh, unquietness. We got all kinds of uh, unpeacefulness going on. What if we are all Christians, all the churches, get down one day and fast for the salvation of the president and his wife Michelle and those two girls? Those two girls, or at least one of them, went and got uh, a tattoo and it was praised. The Bible says you're not to get tattoos. They're on the ways of the world. But yet you count him as an enemy and the Bible says love your enemies. Do good to them. Oh, that's, that's concluding this thing. I want to say one more thing before time's out. Say two things, really. You are to pay taxes, plain and simple. I don't care what kind of government. Now, let me say number two before we close. What if you give your money to your church, and your church uses the money wickedly? Huh? Oh, I don't want to give to a wicked government money. But you give money in your church. How does your church use the money you give it? Do they use some of that money that's not godly? Do they use some of that money that's not for Jesus Christ? Do they give some of that money that, that worships the devil and does things that, that's not, that Christ would not approve of? Why do we say, why should I give money to a wicked government? But then we say, why should I give money to the wicked church? Do you know where your church money goes when you give it there? Do you know the missionaries that your church supports? Are they God-approved? 
Is the money that is being given to your church, is it rightly going about God's business? Is God approved of this service when we worry about, oh, to the wicked government, and oh, it pays the same? I'll tell you what your money, and you can forget about the abortion issue. Here's what your Christian money does in America. It supports the military. It supports policemen and firemen. What would you do if you didn't have policemen and firemen? It supports bringing hot and cold water to your house. It takes the doo-doo from your toilet and brings it away from your house and cleans it up and puts it back in the water nice and clean. It makes sure that when you go get a gallon of gas, it's pretty much around a gallon of gas. It makes sure that the restaurant you're going to, cockroaches don't live back there and have a tent city while you're feasting on the food. It brings lights and electricity to your house. And as the people in Oklahoma today, they have people there searching for loved ones that may be still alive, that your money pays for those people to go there, for the National Guard to do their work, for the rescue services to do their work. What about judges? Your government money pays for judges. It pays for, there are some people out there on food stamps that need it. I'm not talking about the ones that don't need it. I'm talking about there's some honest people out there who really need help with food stamps, and that tax dollars goes to help them. Some education's good. The math they're teaching, that's a good tax thing you're paying to your government. But what, you, know, you don't talk about uh, the Planned Parenthood in the schools and the and the abortions in the schools, and you don't talk about the safe sex. And what about that stuff? No, you don't count that stuff. Look at the good that the government does. How about that? And I close with this one. 